Okay, then, yeah. Welcome everyone to the weekly colloquium of the uh, Physics Institute of the UNAM in Cuernavaca in Mexico. Our guest today is uh, Laura Martignon de la um, Universidad Pedagógica de... Ah, I switched to Spanish from the University of Pedagogic Science in uh, Ludwigsburg in Germany. Yeah, let me say some few words on the vita of Professor Martignon. She obtained her doctor in mathematics at the University of Tübingen and yeah, worked then about 10 years as a professor at the University of Brasilia in Brazil and one and a half year at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And afterwards, she worked a long time at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin. And since 2003, she is a professor of mathematics and mathematical education at the University uh, Ludwigsburg of Education. Um, Professor Martignon is specialized in mathematics education and is an applied mathematician in mathematical modeling, collaborating interdisciplinary scientific context. Um, yeah, in her early work, um, she collaborated with our colleague Thomas Seligman, um, where she applied functional analysis to determine criteria for the applicability of integral transforms in n-body reaction calculations. But yeah, I think more recently, um, um, yeah, um, she is directing her work in probabilistic reasoning, decision making, and uh, connections with mathematical education. And yeah, for example, in this context, she is known for conceptualizing and defining fast and frugal trees for classification and decision. Laura, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to join us today, at least virtually, in our colloquium. Thank you for working late night for us. I think in, in Germany, it's already 8 p.m. And yeah, we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you. It's a great honor and it's a great pleasure to be with you. And it would be even greater if I could be there in Mexico, in Cuernavaca or Mexico City, because I love Mexico. It's the way it is. I hope I will travel again sometime soon to Latin America and to Mexico and Colombia because I'm Colombian and I could give the talk in Spanish, but if English is preferred, I do it in English. So uh, as Thomas Stegman has said, uh, I began my work in mathematics and I worked in several contexts as, a, as an applied mathematician that is someone who can be of help to others who do experiments in different contexts and the help consists in being able to find the formalisms or the instruments from math to write you know science uh, in a consistent and uh, sound and robust way that is I think the function of an applied mathematician but also I work in a mathematics education uh, already 20 years very intensively and uh, the topic I want to you know, explicate and demonstrate today has to do with entropy, mathematical entropy, not thermodynamical entropy. And uh, the importance of it, of course, in the applications, but and that will be the main topic, whether one can start early fostering intuitions about entropy and information in young children. So that is the you know, the topic of this talk, and now we'll be presenting studies, very concrete studies with children on this topic. In my introduction, I want to talk about stochastic in school, probability in school. As you may know, uh, there has been the effort during the last 30 years to uh, implant more stochastic in school with different success. So it's in, in, for instance, in Holland, it has been very successful in Finland, in the United States, at least statistics. Uh, in Germany, the, it has been slower. And uh, I want to mention some results on that because one important study for us, for all educators in the world today is the PISA studies 
And FISA is not, yeah, of course, FISA is the city, but it is not the interpretation of the word FISA here. FISA is a program of international student assessment. And this program evaluates, it, it's financed by the OECD and it evaluates students at the same time in several countries of the world, 32 plus some satellites, at the same time in three main subjects, mathematics, the language of the country, reading and comprehension and science. And it is every three years and every three years, one topic is the main core, 75% of the tasks that these students that are 15 years old have to solve. And the other 25% divided into the other two topics. And 2003, mathematics was the main topic and I happened to be in Mexico right after the PISA studies. And Germany was not very successful at the time. And I want to present <clears throat> a task which became very famous as the two boxes task or the two urns task. You have these two boxes and you have those balls in the boxes and you want white. You want to extract blindly drawing from one of these boxes a white ball, which one is more convenient. So it was a bit disappointing that in Germany, 50, you know, it was more than 15,000 students who were um, examined by PISA, selected in classes all through the schools in Germany. Only 27% were able to give correct answer to these two boxes task. There were other tasks, which I will present. This, I chose this illustration from the book, not, it's not the original one. You have this situation here and you imagine that you go in the direction of the arrow and there are only these four tokens left and yellow rows a one, a one. Which token should yellow move? So the students were asked, what would you do? What is more convenient? And many, too many, more than 60%, they would move their 15 years old with this token here because they have they are in a hurry and they want to get to their houses. But um, you see here that if you move this one, the chances of getting caught by black in the next move are two out of six. Whereas if you move this one, then the chances of caught, uh, catching one token from you for black is only one out of six. So here again, it was disappointing. And there were many other questions, other questions in stochastic where the German kids were not so good. All right, I, would, I don't have time to talk about other countries which were even worse like Italy, but the important thing was the reaction. It was 2003 and there were important reactions. And thanks to PISA, the effort became very serious to implant, to have more stochastic in schools. <clears throat> I have to tell you <clears throat> that the next PISA studies, which would have been in 2021, <coughs> have been postponed to 2022, and <clears throat> there'll be an emphasis in stochastic. So I am very close to people who work in these committees, choosing the task, etc. Christina Reis, who is in Munich is the person in Germany who is the president of the committee uh, and works with the Dutch and the other people who work at the tasks. And one of the reactions to the problems that people have had understanding the newspapers about tests and risks and COVID, et cetera, has been to react and say, we have to teach more stochastic in school. It is very important and PISA can contribute to that. So expect in the new, in the next uh, PISA study, which will be again how, the main core mathematics, many questions in uncertainty. That's the, the name of the tasks group in uh, statistics and probability. I, our work, sorry, here, our work, a group of people in Germany uh, have found it uh, back in the 70s, this journal, Stochastik in der Schule, dedicated to teachers, mainly to teachers, written by university guys and also teachers, to, you know, to provide more and more understanding of stochastics and implement more stochastic in schools. 
I have written a book, which you see here, dedicated to risk competency. It's all stochastic, of course. And <clears throat> I am translating it now into Spanish with help of someone. And there is a publisher in Mexico that has decided to publish this book in Spanish. So it's a little propaganda. And now I want to go to the topic of information. You see, information and entropy, of course, require stochastic. The mathematical formalization of uh, information and entropy is through probabilities. And I will very briefly remind you of the origin of the ideas of Claude Shannon. There were many people working in communication and transmission of messages, etc. But Shannon was the one who crystallized the ideas in a very important work and somehow defined the important concepts in a very important paper in 48. But there have been many others. And now you see here, assume that you want to guess or determine this little square here, and you only have yes or no questions. So this is like the parlor game. You think of a person and the others have to guess who person, who, which person you're thinking about by asking only yes, no questions. So if there are 64 fields here or little cells, then you need six questions. As we know, you may ask, is it larger than 32 or is the square in the one of the the left half and you continue and in six steps if you do it well always with the split half heuristics you will need only six questions to determine this square or to determine a number between one and 64. Okay information content was defined by Shannon and by others Shannon is not the only one generalizing this if you have a partition of a set in these disjoint cells then the information content of each cell is minus, you took the minus from the game above, minus the logarithm in base two of the probability of that cell. This is the generalization, Shannon. And now the important thing is that if you average information, the average information content of the distribution of the partition we had with the distribution P that we had on it is minus the sum of pi logarithm base two of pi. So it's just the average. This is entropy. And you know the story that it was von Neumann telling the guys in information theory, in Shannon also. And he suggested, you call it entropy. It's a fascinating term. And people say that von Neumann said, and it's obscure. People don't know exactly what it means. OK, entropy was established mathematically. And one important consequence of entropy for empirical work was the extension of Laplace's principle. Laplace in the 18th century or you know, in 1814, when his book Theorie, Anal Theorie Analytique de Probabilité, I have a facsimile here. In that book, he recommends if you don't know, if you don't know anything about the distribution in a random experiment, then you should go from the priori distribution, which is evenly distributed from the uniform distribution. And then the more you get to know, you can update this distribution. That's called Laplace's principle of indifference. Fine. This was used, but it was, of course, not so convenient because there are situations in which you do know some marginals of the distribution. And so the important thing was to find an extension of this principle that takes into account some knowledge of the distribution. And James, Edwin James in 1956, formula, formulated the principle called that we call today max ent, which is the following. If you do know something about a distribution and you can express it in form of marginals of the distribution, you can find, and this is the best, he recommended the best possible a priori distribution that you can use is the one that maximizes entropy in the set of those that respect those marginal informations. So 
Max Ent is the principle that is, if you do have some information on your distribution, just take the one which maximizes entropy with those conditions. A good principle, the important thing is how to construct such Max Ent distributions. And luckily, Caesar, a Hungarian mathematics a mathematician, proved many things about entropy and about the properties of entropy, and also produced the first example of a very good algorithm for finding the maximal entropy distribution. It's called the Iterative proportion, Proportional Fitting Procedure, IPFP. And that, of course, caused the revolution until today. The, you know, the applications of this principle in vision, in neuroscience, in, photo in many, many, in biology of many kinds, is immense due to the possibility of using good algorithms, which are very sweet. But now, this is Laplace, and this is Jane's, and this is very serious stuff, very deep mathematics. But now we want, that is what I want to talk about today, how these ideas may reach this little student, this young student in his desk. So from the big ideas of Laplace and James, distributions, etc., can we do something to start early to foster first intuitions about information and entropy? This is my topic here. And the answer is, of course, yes, this is work that I have done with others, with research, with you know, grants from the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, uh, other colleagues, which I will you know, site at the end, uh, Jonathan Nelson, American, but he's now working in England, and master students of us, we worked doing what I'm going to tell you about now. So you may know the game, who is it, which is the parlor game, you know, you have here this grid of faces, and you have to determine that your opponent has chosen one of these cards, perhaps randomly, and you are allowed to ask yes, no questions. And of course, the, the one who guesses first, who determines first wins. And the question is, how do you do it in a good way? So this was the idea. The idea was to use this game in school with fourth graders. These are nine years old children and fifth graders and see whether they played, they played well, and they can acquire intuitions about what is behind this game. So this kind of investigation has a standard way of doing things. You have a control group and you have an experimental group and you do a pretest to see what they can do at the pretest. Then you have interventions, some hours, two hours, three hours. And the schools have to accept your presence or the present, uh, presence of you know, students who study these things and these you know, do the interventions, play, et cetera, et cetera. And then there is a post-test to test what has been gained through the interventions. And then some months later, sometimes years later, you do a follow-up test to see what has remained of all this. Okay, going back to the game, of course, there is an optimal strategy. You can, of course, find the optimal strategy. In the case of those faces that you saw, the best question is, is it male? Because, you know, it's a split half thing. There are half many males and women, so female. So that is a very good question to start with. If the answer is no, if the answer is no, you will ask whether the person who is a woman has earrings. And if it is yes, you'll ask, does the man have a beard, etc. So the first thing was to play this game often and see how children adapted to the game and then test whether they would recognize in this non-representative environment where gender is not the best question, whether they would extract a good question, the, the good first question. And then the next good question. You see, there is a lot of strategy here because it's a stepwise procedure and you have to start with a very good question and then try to subdivide somehow the remaining set that you have in half. Okay, 
So here, the, again, you can, of course, in the special case, see what would be the best strategy. The question was not whether the children get the best strategy, but, but how close. So we had to define a measure of success in this sense. And then we played another game after this. We went to an easier game, just guessing a number out of 64 or out of eight or out of some power of two. And the, the teacher played the game first with the children guess a number that I have thought from 1 to 8 or 1 to 32 and the children were guessing and she was observing in this case we're all two the students were all female they were observing how the children do it and then there was also the idea of encoding the way they the strategy that they had chosen could then produce an encoding with these cubes Red for, uh, red for no, for the answer no, and green for the answer yes. And the question was, do they learn to encode and decode this kind of word? So the number between one and eight can be coded in with three bits. We can call these bits of information. So this is also part of the intervention. And I could tell you, I could spend a lot of time on this slide you know, usefulness of, of first cues, et cetera. But the important thing is that I want you to believe that we were successful, that in the, not only in the post-test, but also in the follow-up test, these children worked well coding and decoding, even changing the numbers, even having larger powers of two. And uh, they were good at playing the game, the who is it game with other environments, with other cues. And also something that became better was their using the use of proportions, which is an important component for probabilities, working with proportions. As we saw in the task of the PISA test, it's about proportions. So we consider this study very successful. Uh, published in Cognition, published in uh, Sochastik in der Schule, in Mathematik Lehren, so you know, this kind of journals for teachers, but in Cognition, which is one of the very serious journals in cognitive psychology. So the next game is called Mastermind. Does anyone play Mastermind? Does any one of you know how the rules are here? I am asking. I don't know. You don't know? No, no. Sure. Mm, do you know, Louis Bennett? Louis? Yes, Without yes, Sagara, I do. Mastermind. And yes, so yes. can you explain? Could you explain briefly how this goes? Well, I, I think most of people know because they are closer to my age than Thomas. But anyway, the yes. idea is to guess. I mean, what we see in the, I don't know, lower part of, I mean, the arrangement in the lower part of the, of the picture. Mm -hmm. And simply you guess and then you get, I think it is a white uh, stick if there is uh, the color is correct but not the position and a red if the color is uh, correct and the position but you never say which one is which one i mean it may be both one two four yes so this is the game and as you perhaps have it you know have guessed it has to do with entropy because the more you see you could think what where do you take your little tokens from and so the way that we transformed it into an entropy game was you know for the children starting with these urns so the, you know behälter plastic plastic boxes uh, where you placed cubes and you have different distributions and the question was the, you know, playing the game meant extracting three, for instance, of these cubes, and your opponent would have to say, to guess the code. It's about knacking the code. So guessing the code. And the question was whether children playing this game would acquire a sense for the difficulty or easiness to play the game, which has is connected with the entropy of the, the boxes. So obviously, box B becomes very easy. If you are always extracting from this box, children will notice. C is the most difficult. 
entropy is maximal. A, one can compute, of course, the entropy. And so this was the idea. So the educational unit now consisted of a lot of playing like this, extracting, hiding your three. It was not four in this case, we played with three and the opponent had to guess. And then to letting the children compose the urns and asking them which one is difficult, which one is easy, how can you make it more difficult, et cetera. So this was the educational unit. And parallel to this, of course, was this idea of letting them work with proportions. So here, this is the kind you know, of generated code and someone guesses yellow, 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 and you have one smiley, you see the position is not relevant here. You have that kind of smiley and two frownies because two are wrong, etc. So this was played and played, 60 children, different classes. So different fourth classes, this was all fourth class. And at the same time, we had to let them work with proportions. So at the same time they were playing and in, in other, in, in half of the hour, they were answering these questions. You recognize here the PISA question of 2003. You have two jars, which is more com convenient. And here you have something about Joachim's aunt. You know, there are lettuces, some of them are bad. And you have two gardens, Joachim's aunt and Joachim's uncle. And you have to decide which one is more convenient if you want, of course, good lettuces. So proportions and the game mastermind were practically done in the same context, during the same intervention in parallel. Okay, so here, uh, this is now in the post-test and after this kind of question, after they practiced, you see <laughs> the handwriting. I would choose jar here. I would use jar one because it contains only three marbles in total so that it's easier to draw a white marble. Not so bad. Here, I take jar two because it contains two white marbles and jar one, just one. This is the very famous Piaget additive bias. Where there is more, it is better. Not getting the sense of proportions. Okay, so we were surprised that, of course, we had a lot of the positive bias here, this additive bias in the post-test, but it became a lot better, a lot better through playing Entropy Mastermind. So playing Entropy Mastermind not just helped, you know, getting an intuition for entropy, but also to gain a better sense of proportions. So another task was here. Let me see. Can you read the top? Or am I? So the, this is the construction of jars. You have to construct jars, or you have to decide which jar is more difficult for playing mastermind, etc. So this is the kind of tasks in the post test that the children had to do in the end. You can look at them. You have to underlie the statement here. I don't know if you can read this well, whether it is too small. It's a bit difficult to, okay. to see. And so. I don't have an instrument. So this was a mistake. Okay. Mm -hmm. So below you have to underline the statement that is correct in the one, two, three below the, the lowest question. The left jar is harder to play with, or the right jar is harder to play with, the jars are equally hard to play. So they have to compare these two jars with the composition that you're seeing there and judge, make these judgments. Okay? So these are comparison or constructions and deciding how to construct difficult tasks for the corresponding codes that you have to guess. Okay. So again, the important thing with this game was to see whether children gained intuitions about the difficulty 
you know, guessing the codes depending on the composition of the jar. And the composition of the jar, of course, is closely connected to the entropy of these jars. This was one thing. And on the other side, we thought that strengthening intuitions for proportional thinking, strengthening their sense of proportions, was a side effect that we wanted. And here I have to explain that, you see, in elementary school in Germany, there used to be much more stuff, much more math. It was eliminated, it was passed through to fifth class, for instance, fractions, because of the dominating ideas of the 70s that elementary school should be mainly, you know, rechnung, mainly adding and subtracting and not so much fractions because fractions were considered difficult. This is not the same in other countries. For instance, Holland, they do fractions in fourth class. Uh, we thought that it is important to have some sense of proportion already in fourth class because it is a preparation for probability. So this is why we pack the two things together in this kind of work, having fraction, having proportions, not fractions, comparisons of fractions, like in the jar problems of the PISA studies, and uh, having uh, at the same time fostering intuitions about the composition of distributions. Okay, again, I could talk for hours on these results. You know, we classified children's answers. We studied the uh, children's answers with different criteria. And here you see the wrong additive understanding of proportion is the kind of mistake that you choose the jar where there are two white and five black because there are more. It's called the additive bias. Already Piaget studied this. Okay, and several other kind of argumentations. And here again, there was a, not just a post-test, but a follow-up test. And we consider this a great success because of the 60 children of two classes, after fourth classes, after three months, they remembered a lot, they were good at playing, they had understood connecting the difficulty of jars with the uh, difficulty of, you know, the distribution of the jars with the difficulty of knacking the code or guessing the code, and also with this fraction and uh, with these proportional tasks. So again, we had a success, 60% of these children were very good. And we decided, and we published this in Frontiers. I can send the paper if you're interested. Children learn to play and learn to assess proportions. So this is basically what I wanted to tell you. And of course, I have to give some conclusions. You see, the conclusions we have, there is a lot of publications connected to this. One important one was consider on this uh, guess who game. I mentioned the publication in cognition, which again, you cannot see too well. And now we have you know, completed the studies on mastermind, which we are extending. We are extending them in some ways. One of them is wanting to see whether the jars, playing with your hands in the jars, is better for understanding what you're doing than seeing everything on a screen. So one of the actual discussions is on embodied cognition, whether playing with a screen and seeing everything digital as the games are today, and also Mastermind, there are versions of it that we, some of our colleagues have constructed, uh, whether this provides better intuitions than playing with the jars and composing the jars and just having iconic representations for the jars. And the first results seem to be in favor of the jars, seem to confirm the embodied cognition hypothesis that playing with real objects and your hands, etc., strengthens, you know, neural activities in the cerebellum, etc., which fix better the kind of learning about, uh, you know, this phenomenon. So this is a partial result for now, but we are working in this direction. Uh, 
And now let me acknowledge here the people I've worked with, especially, so these are the common people to, of the two studies, Jonathan Nelson, main researcher here. He is a cognitive psychology, but very trained in statistics and math. Elif Özel, who is now at the Pedagogical University in Freiburg. She did her master with me and now she is working on a PhD thesis in Freiburg. And Lara Bertram, who is at the Max Planck for Biologische Kubernetik now in Tübingen. And she's also working with uh, Jonathan Nelson in Surrey. He's now in Surrey as a reader for um, cognition and information. All this was funded by the German Research Foundation. And to, of course, we are extremely grateful, grateful because these studies are demanding and require a lot of instruments and uh, you know, recruiting schools, etc. So it is a demanding activity. I am ready now. It's shorter than you thought. But we can discuss, I think, and uh, if there are things that I should explain better, please tell me. This is what I wanted to tell you. Okay, thank you very much, Laura. Thank you very much for this very nice, um, very clear talk. So the panel is open for questions, comments. Um, <laughs> Gloria already raised her hand, so please go ahead. I, I, let me see whether I can see her. Let me move this. Ah, yes, I think Gloria. Oh, no, I don't see Gloria. I, uh, ah, yes, now I see. No. Yes, my camera's on. Okay. Thank you very much. This is uh, really very, very interesting. Uh, we have a, a debate with a colleague. Well, it's actually not a debate. We both agree um, in terms of uh, the students that we get at the uh, higher levels where we teach uh, really have strong deficiencies that go back all the way to grade school. And so we have often said that it's better that uh, in grade school they are, they're not taught any physics, for example, and in high school they're not taught any physics because physics that's very poorly taught then simply just propagates into you know, into the university and, and students uh, don't understand anything. And so I wanted to ask your, uh, your opinion on, on this uh, perspective. Is it better to not teach any mathematics or any, you know, any mathematics or physics anywhere until they reach high enough levels where their teachers will be competent enough? So I guess what I'm questioning here is how do you deal with education systems where teachers are not competent to teach at the lowest levels, these more complicated topics? Okay, we, you know that of course, I belong to those who want to teach a lot in school. I think I've made that clear. I hope I've made it clear. Yes. And of course I think, and this is not just an educational perspective, but also a political one, that if you offer good education, by, oh, I want to cite Moshinsky here. And if Thomas is around, he will confirm, you know, that basic education and, and also good, you know, professional teachers, etc., are the basis, not just of, you know, democracy, but also the basis of competent life. Right. I don't know if you know, but people during the COVID pandemic, we're at loss. They, the, the journalists made horrible mistakes and the media made mistakes and they didn't understand what the sensitivity of a test is. If the test is positive, they think they are ill without consulting, you know, without understanding that there is something behind based there, you know, all these things were so dramatic in, during this period. They don't know anything about the exponential function. I mean, I, I don't know if you have seen this in Mexico, strong, uh, AMLO doesn't know anything about the exponential function, I think. He has said things that prove this. And of course, we have to learn better in school. We have to have a sense of what is a growth function, what is an exponential function. We need basic stochastic. We need, we need it. So, of course, I am on that side of the front here. I am, of course, for more stuff. 
And the question is whether you can have very competent teachers. I don't know if you know that in Mexico, the variance between very good schools, you see the PISA studies have been showing again and again that Mexico and Chile are the best countries in Latin America, you know, very decent results, but there is an incredible variance between private schools, which are, the PREFA is very good. Yeah, the school you have in Mexico associated with the UNAM is excellent. Then you have Los Salesianos and the Marymount and so on. You have these very good private schools and then American schools. And those went very well. They were compar comparable to European standards. So the problem in Mexico is this variance. In Germany, the variance is between regions. You see, Bavaria has very good school types and very good educational system. And Bremen, a little less. So that was the variance. And also in Germany, you have three school types and that causes a bit of a problem. That was one of the problems here. So definitely I am in favor of teaching very well and preparing very good teachers. And I'm also in favor of having, as in Germany, uh, physics and math covering many hours of the program. So students here have five hours German per week, five hours math, the same number of hours for the language and math. Besides, they have three hours of science, which varies a bit, and this is the minimum, you know? So I'm this not, is my- I'm not questioning, I, I don't question it. I, I'm completely in agreement with what you're, you're saying. Yeah. That education yes. and the more education, the better. I agree with that 100%. Mm -hmm. But where the question comes in is what do you do in a system in which you are not able to have competent teachers? And, and so where the teachers, if the teachers are not competent, you ask them to teach things that they're not capable of transmitting, hoping that the students will figure out a way to learn it on their own, or do you just tell them not to try to do that? Yeah, so the first, you see, again, I, I'm citing guys, some of them, from, you have to start preparing good teachers. So, yeah. you know, it starts from, it's from top to bottom. You have to prepare very good teachers. And again, Mexico is not the worst country in Latin America. So there are good teachers. Not all. You have this incredible variance. You know, there is, it's perhaps a little shocking that there is that variance in Mexico, but you have the possibility of preparing very good teachers. And they exist. And there is this uh, Universidad Pedagogica. I know Natalia, I know some people from there, La Señora San, Eleonora Santillana. Do you know she, she was rector of the school for many years? You know, they're very good people. But of course, you need to start well, to prepare the good teachers and to send the teachers, not just in the very good schools in Mexico City and Cuernavaca, but to all the country. This is one problem which is also political. This is not just educational. Right. Yeah. Thank you for this question. I, <laughs> yeah, very good question. Okay. Are there further questions, comments from the audience? Yeah. Um, um, I have more comments than, than, than the question. You already mentioned it, Laura. The, um, yeah. But I think we all of us, we were a bit surprised by the lack of understanding of basic statistics, which we saw in this recent um, Corona pandemic. I don't know what is, what is your opinion on this. I saw some you know, that people are... Um, afraid of getting vaccinated because of some few rare cases and say yes um, you see the scandal what the scandal is not the people okay the yeah. people are just read the news and yeah. see so the scandal in this pandemic and we are writing against it is the media the media in germany for instance you know they they somehow exaggerate in the media 
the, for instance, AstraZeneca. There was there was a scandalous critique of AstraZeneca, and you know the risk of having um, thrombo. Uh, how do you say these clots, these blood clots, etc. With AstraZeneca, is like uh, how do you say walking on the street, and if a stone falls from some andamio on the street, it's you know it's comparable to that. So. It's a poor understanding of what is one to 100,000 or one to 250,000. You know, of course, the, the numbers are large, etc. But people were so scared by AstraZeneca. There was a scandal. People were not accepting the vaccines and in Italy and in Germany. And so the media are one of the problems. So I consider the media, I would go to the extreme of calling them even a little dishonest, exaggerating this, the worries of the people. And some media, some things that were consulted in internet really had wrong information. I could send links, you know, there were. So of course this was the great test, you know, to people's understanding of risks, of proportions and of basic Bayesian concepts like sensitivity and specificity and predictive value of a test. So that is why, <laughs> you know, I, you will see the next year when the PISA studies come, the big chunk of questions is going to be argumentation based on data, argumentieren, anhand von Daten and probabilities and statistics. It will be the, the big thing, not Corbin discussion, you know, yeah, I think. <laughs> yeah, geometry, yeah. <laughs> and curiosity theorists okay. run on all this, because something happened somewhere, I mean, uh, I like to give the example to my students, that if you take the series of a hundred numbers at roulette table that have occurred in the last eight days or three days or whatever it takes for a hundred throws. Uh, and they often now appear somewhere on the table. Is that more probable or less probable than to have a hundred zeros? Mm -hmm. And uh, well, some of them begin to think a little, but they, they still intuitively uh, no, 100 zeros doesn't occur. This has occurred, so it occurs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that yes. this sequence is exactly the same probability of occurring uh, mm -hmm. is the very, mm -hmm. so the, the fact that all of a sudden the scientists come out, and in the case of Johnson & Johnson, it was even more extreme, mm -hmm. that, that they say, oh, but we have to stop this for two weeks to analyze because we had... I think at the beginning they had 11 cases, in the end they had 46 out of two and a half million. Uh, and that was not people who died, that was just people who, who had the syndrome. I think two died out of two and a half million, so what? Now then mm -hmm. that it turned out that they were, I think, all except one women, mm -hmm. seems to give it at least some statistical significance. But then, um, particularly in Germany, I saw that as first, Berlin said, okay, we won't give AstraZeneca to women under 50. Yeah. And then all of, all of Germany decided, no, we won't give it to anybody <laughs> under 60. Uh, and when men are really obviously not affected by this problem. So um, yeah. and the, the, the whole idea that, um, uh, and I do, certainly the media played it up, but I think that your science uh, whatever it's called, or the, this institute, Robert Koch Institute, I don't know who finally decides, or mm -hmm. the, the CDC in the United States, that they are simply idiots that they don't shut up until they have more data. Okay, so listen, this is, there are two things that you're mentioning here. One is the very famous biases studied by the cognitive psychologists like Kahneman and Tversky and Gigerens and all these guys have studied the kind of biases that people have when they deal with statistics or probabilities. So this is one topic and this is serious. And when we want to teach in school, 
you know, elementary probabilities with proportions, etc. We also want to train children already to be less keen to falling into those cognitive biases traps that you were mentioning, to preparing them for that. That oh, you one, that is good. Excuse me. Yeah, you are preparing them for that. That's great. You're preparing. So one of the big things, for instance, of course, sensitivity, as you know, that there is this bias that people think that if the test is positive, you know, we know, for instance, in the HIV, HIV literature, that people tend to become so worried and think of suicide because they test positive. And if you compute, because the base rate of the disease is so important in that little formula of Bayes' theorem that has a big influence on the predictive value, okay, you can resolve, you can at least make these problems less large in school if you teach these things, as I have told you sometimes, with these natural frequencies, natural formats, icon arrays, etc. So there is all that work against these biases, and that enters, of course, you know, the probability teaching in school and the textbooks, etc. So that's one thing. But the other thing is, as you just mentioned, in the special case of Germany, the Robert Koch Institute was very serious and the Leopoldina were serious. And some guys, you, you know, in the end, with all these media saying disparate things, you learn to select those guys who speak seriously. And for instance, I don't know if you have heard Lauterbach. So there are some people who try to be serious and read all the possible information about data in other countries, etc. But I agree with you that the problem was not having enough data and having to manage things without enough data. And here, if you want, I don't know if you thought like this, but in this country, for instance, the beginning of the treatment was very in the sense of fast and frugal trees. You don't have enough data, you have to do something, you have to act, and you have to do something which is as careful as possible with those data you have at hand. You cannot wait, you see that as a lesson, you cannot wait, as some economists in the United States said, like your need is, you can wait until you have better data. You know, the dead are on the streets and it's not, the numbers are not like car accidents because it's exponential growth. So I was in favor of the, you know, the very quick handling at the beginning of the pandemic, Merkel being very serious and the Robert Koch Institute being very well respected, etc. And then it started what you saw you know, starting in November of last year, the, the different states in Germany wanting to do something difficult and the oppositions and the media, and then it became chaotic. It definitely became chaotic. And we are not yet on a good way to, of being strict again because of several phenomena. But you, I agree with you in many things that you said, not that we should have waited for more data because we had there was a necessity of action. And then it was like Herbert Simon says, if you have little information and you have to act, try to be satisfying, try to do, to choose that solution that somehow satisfies and suffices and act quickly. Thomas, don't disappear. No, I'm here. I'm okay. here, all right. I can even show you a picture if you want. Okay. <laughs> I only don't hear very well when uh, okay. I have the picture on. Uh, okay. I mean, I still have a strong feeling that not in the matter of original lockdowns and these things, but in the matter of uh, helping to spread stupid rumors about the AstraZeneca thing, and now there seems to be one about either coming out these days mm -hmm. um, that uh, the um, that they were mainly concerned in conserving their position mm -hmm. because at that with the incidence the high incidence that existed when this AstraZeneca thing comes up independent if there was a causal connection or not the simply as you said it was like uh, one in a quarter of a million that you would get that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was probably like one, I don't know, in a hundred or one in 10 that you will get uh, 
a problem, well, probably one in a hundred that you get a bad problem from mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, contracting the disease. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, uh, you know, today, exactly today, I was reading in the Zeit an interview with Giga Renza, who used to be my boss, and he's always consulted on these things. And he says the same things you're saying. You see, the media have got, and, and they're not, you know, the, it is difficult for people to understand what is one out of 250,000. So what is that? It's like one in the city of Tübingen. No, Tübingen has less inhabitants. So what is it? How do I compare this? So we agree that there is this difficulty and that school could improve this, could improve this understanding with proportions, etc. And then there is <clears throat> this propaganda, which in some sense is tendentious. I found that this propaganda against AstraZeneca seem to even have some nationalistic things and Brexit uh, critiques. So there was a lot of politics involved, which I didn't like, and I thought they should not be listened to, but they of course had an, a, great, a great power. And the serious institutions like the Robert Koch Institute publishing every day and you know, the John Hopkins data every day, et cetera, those should be you know, taken care of. And the incidence problem, you know, you know this thing, establishing that if the incidence is less than 100 in 100,000 or something like that, then you start opening the stores. But if it's more than you don't, you see, people had trouble understanding that. What is this incidence number? What is R0? So definitely one of the big things that came out of this whole period is rec recognizing that we have Going back to the problem of school, we need to prepare people better with good methods, et cetera, to be more independent, less depending on media and on, you know, imposters sometimes, so that they can go to the data themselves in the internet and make their own judgments. Georg? Okay. Georg Jakob? Yes. Uh, okay, you were here from the beginning. So, what what have you thought of you know the preparation of people dealing with the information of media during COVID? Mm. Well, um, I also had the impression that it wasn't handled that well, but. Um, hmm. I didn't quite think that it was uh, only due to, or that much due to the media, mm -hmm. uh, because um, I think most of the people weren't very well informed anyway, or informed at all, and just interchanged some rumors or something like that uh, between each other, mm -hmm. which led to uh, even more misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but... Uh, Probably, I think my impression was a little bit uh, far-fetched, so your, uh, yours was probably a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, as I said, the only thing, <laughs> you see, there has been this crazy benefit. We call it the crazy benefit of COVID. It, it's a very bad thing that COVID had to come so that the PISA study 2022 we dedicate this big chunk of questions to statistics and probability and something called argumentation based on data, argumentieren anhand von Daten. There'll be mm -hmm. many questions on that. And this was necessary. You see, the, it was important that people realize that although geometry, you see, uh, having more stochastic in school means having less geometry because you cannot reduce the function, the function thing, you cannot. So it's always, geometry is always in danger because the number of hours will not change that, that children and students have. In Are the plans in, in German changing? Are they... Um, Lehrpläne, uh, of course. Yes. Yes. Constant, not well, not constantly. No, are, are they changing in this direction to implement? Yes. Oh, you want? Oh, listen, listen. If you want information, if you're very interested, I can send you things from the 
you know, in the ministry in Bavaria, for instance, has now the Lehrpläne, which are coming in June next year, they are now, they already exist now, they cover much more probabilities than what is already there. So there has been a movement during the last 30 years of implementing more and more, timidly at the beginning, but now it's very serious. And yes, of course, the Lehrpläne and the books are changing and there is much more, but still not enough. So this is our position. Yeah. If you're okay. interested, I'll send you, I'll send you links to the Lehrpläne in Baden-Württemberg, <laughs> but the best is Bavaria, you see. And, and then the second best is Sachsen in this direction. Okay. I would like to make one comment for the benefit of the local people, at least some 16, 17 years ago when my daughter went to primary and secondary school and I was in contact with Laura since long before then, it turned out that concerning teaching of statistics at school, we were much better than Germany. Mm -hmm. Yes. I don't know how it's today. <laughs> Again, when you say we, don't forget, Thomas, that if you look at the, at the PISA results for Mexico, we is a bit of a new, it's not. So the good schools in Mexico. You have this problem in Mexico. The very good so schools. My daughter, the secondary school, she was in, the, she was public school and uh, Still, they, they, I mean, how much they actually learned is one thing, but they had the statistics, or not statistics, but probability at least, on the curriculum. Curriculum, yes. Whether they, yes. The, the, the quality of the teacher is a different matter, but it was simply, uh, I mean, at least present, when yes. I was young, it was simply inexistent in Inexist. the curriculum. Now, that's a very long time ago, but mm -hmm. it was inexistent in the curriculum. Yes. Anyway, any statistics you might learn was from the parents, and that was about it. Yeah. Even I can I, confirm this, Thomas. So in my, in my school career, statistics was a very, very small part, and a huge part of geometry and discussing curves, which is the most stupid things what you can Well, if you, dis if you discuss the exponential function, this is not so stupid. No, this is about finding maxima, and mini minima, and uh, polynomial functions is... <laughs> 30 cuts. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> okay. There's one problem with my talk that I have another meeting at 9.30. Okay. I could talk for hours with you, but I do have this other thing today which is a bit yeah. sad, but okay. uh, if you want links, I'll send you links, Thomas, to the uh, Lehrpläne because they exist. It's all. Okay. Yeah. And you will see. And Thomas is right in saying that Germany has been very slow. And this again has reasons uh, slower than Holland, for instance, and even slower than France. But Mexico has had the advantage of being close to the United States. You know, there are lots of jokes on this being close to the United States, I know that one positive thing is that there is an influence and the curricula, that the curricula contains statistics and probabilities is this influence. For instance, the schools in Monterrey have more statistics than schools in Mexico City. Uh, there is another advantage that we get under the hand additional vaccines because obviously they are more interested that underdeveloped or developing nations which are nearby, which in this case, unfortunately, includes Canada, who knows why, uh, with a very low vaccine rate, they get gifted and uh, mainly AstraZeneca. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, so this was my talk. I okay. did, uh, we did not discuss about who is it in mastermind much. But I am very happy having been with you. And I remember, I think it was Francois who gave me, a, do you remember a facsimile with Laplace work? I think it was Francois, but I don't see him now. So I remember in my last visit in, in Mexico, someone gave me Theorie Analytique de Probabilité, uh, a facsimile of Laplace's work. 
and that was great. So I have very fond memories of Mexico. Okay. I think that may well have been me indeed. Yes, you remember. Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you. You're nice very welcome. It's a beautiful <laughs> book. It's a beautiful it's a book. beautiful book. Yes. Laplace was not such a fantastic person because he, you know, he was politically always with those who were, uh, you know, he was a, a monarchist, and then a revolutionary, and then again. So he changed his flag uh, with the different political situations in France. So that's not so special. But, you know, with Napoleon, he was with Napoleon, and then he tried to be with the next, etc. But he was so such a scientist and such a writer. It's oh, still... Yeah. So thank you. You're thank very welcome. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you, Laura. Thank you very much. It was a very nice talk. And yeah.